Hi everyone, my name is Nicole. I am a library and information science student and I will be starting off this webinar, which is brought to you by Stony Brook Medicine's Healthy Libraries Program. This webinar is about working from home and the importance of sleep. These are our student presenters who will be presenting today in the webinar. Next slide. And uh, by the end of this webinar, participants will be able to understand the basics of sleep and the importance of getting a good night's sleep, tips and tricks for improving sleep at night, identify how the pandemic has affected work culture, manage working from home, better combat workplace fatigue while working from home, and better separate work and leisure while at home. So what is sleep? Sleep is a complex biological process. While you are sleeping, you're unconscious, but your brain and body functions are still active. They are doing a number of important jobs that help you stay healthy and function at your best. So when you don't get enough quality sleep, it does more than just make you feel tired. It can affect your physical and mental health, thinking and daily functioning. There are five stages of sleep during the sleep cycle. Stage one, two, three, and four are categorized as non-REM sleep. And the fifth stage is REM sleep. REM is a uh, rapid eye movement, just so you all know. Okay, next slide, please. So stage one of sleep cycle is the lightest stage of sleep. The EEG brain frequency is slightly slower than during wake time. There is muscle tone present in the skeletal muscles. Breathing occurs at a regular rate. And stage two usually follows stage one and represents deeper sleep. During stage two sleep, the sleeper is less able to be awakened. Stage two sleep is characterized by sawtooth waves and sleep spindles. Stage three and four of sleep are the stages of the sleep cycle that are progressively deeper stages of sleep. These stages of sleep are, are also called slow wave sleep or delta sleep. A sleeper in slow wave sleep is often difficult to awaken. And some studies have demonstrated that very loud noises will not awaken some during slow wave sleep. As humans get older, they spend less time in slow wave sleep and more time in stage two sleep. And this is generally referred to as deep sleep. And stage five of the sleep cycle or REM sleep is the, sleep, the stage of sleep associated with dreaming. It is very different physiologically from the other stages of sleep. The EEG resembles wake time. However, the skeletal muscles are atonic or without movement and breathing is more erratic and irregular. The heart rate often increases and it is theorized that muscle atonia evolved in order to protect the individual from injury during sleep. Um, okay, I'm Samantha, here. sorry. <laughs> I'm Samantha, I'm a nursing student and I'll be talking about the basics of sleep. So the amount of sleep a person gets greatly influences their health and work performance. Not getting enough sleep can actually increase your risk for obesity, type two diabetes, high blood pressure, heart disease, stroke, and poor mental health. One night of short or poor quality sleep will likely make you feel tired, non-productive, grumpy, and even increases the likelihood of being involved in a motor vehicle accident. Adults ages 18 to 60 require seven or more hours of sleep per night. Sleep quality is also important. If you find yourself feeling sleepy after getting enough sleep, you may need better sleep habits. Next slide. Sleep and obesity, increased blood sugar and high blood pressure. The loss of sleep creates an imbalance between leptin and ghrelin, which are hormones that regulate appetite. This imbalance increases hunger. Growth hormone deficiency and increased cortisol levels are other effects of sleep deprivation, which can be linked to obesity. Additionally, increased cortisol levels are also linked to the increased blood sugars in type two diabetes. Insufficient sleep decreases overall food metabolism as well. These swings in hormones and potential increases in weight and blood sugars 
can also lead eventually to high blood pressure. Next. Hello, I'm James. I'm also a nursing student at Stony Brook University. I'm gonna be talking about sleep and depression. So sleep and depression are things that go hand in hand. The amount of sleep that's gained each night really has an impact on the mental health for the day, specifically talking here about depression. Um, according to John Hopkins, people suffering from insomnia, which we know is a um, sleep disorder that people just can't sleep for hours and hours on end, are at higher risk for developing depression due to the lack of sleep. Among people with depression, 75% of the people have trouble falling asleep or staying asleep at night, meaning that they're constantly waking up. Sleep and depression have a bi-directional relationship. So what that means is that sleep or lack of sleep rather causes depression and depression can further cause a lack of sleep. And this lack of sleep is um, shown to have a degrading effect on serotonin, which is a, a neurotransmitter in the brain that's responsible for good mood along with other things physiologically. So the prolonged periods of not sleeping affect the receptors, which serotonin binds to. And when there's not enough serotonin binding to these receptors, you have decreased mood and more uh, depression symptoms. Hi, everyone. I'm Melanie. I'm also a nursing student at Stony Brook University. Um, we have kind of alluded to what is called the circadian rhythm um, in the presentation thus far. And this slide really goes into what that is exactly. Um, and it is the 20, it is the body's 24 hour internal clock. Um, the sleep wake cycle is the clearest example of the importance of the circadian rhythm. But there's many aspects that work uh, of our body that work into the circadian rhythm as well. Um, so during the daytime, light exposure um, signals us to stay alert and awake, which is great and what we want. And then at nighttime, um, the, the, it initiates the melatonin to signal sleep, which is of course what we want at that point in the day. Um, and this enables a cycle of activity and rest day in and day out. The um, illustration on the right, I believe is a nice example. Um, the graphic is situated like a clock. So midnight is up uh, at, at the top, um, noon at the bottom. And as you go throughout the day, it indicates throughout the, um, throughout the circle what actually is happening to, uh, to your body. And this particular illustration is good from a nursing perspective. Um, it, it actually talks about the lowest, temp, uh, lowest points in your body's uh, temperature during the day, the highest points, highest blood pressure, lowest blood pressure. Um, and this, you know, you can make many inferences out of this, like when's the best time to eat? When's the best time to exercise? Um, there is a point over at about, um, you know, six, seven o'clock talking about the muscle strength and cardiovascular efficiency. Um, and then of course it gets up towards, you know, seven, uh, towards, towards the, the darker uh, hours of the day um, where the melatonin starts to um, secrete and that actually is signaling the time to sleep. Um, we've also mentioned the other systems that are involved in this. So there's metabolism, blood sugar, cholesterol, mental health, and immune system. It's all inter, um, interconnected. So things that affect your circadian rhythm, think about jet lag, um, how that might affect you as you, as you travel or um, people who work shift work, um, and then a variety of other sleep disorders like maybe sleep apnea, or even something as simple as the, um, the daylight savings time we experienced this weekend. That can affect it as well. Next slide. And we're gonna also talk about blue light. Um, blue light, just technical term or definition is the electromagnetic radiation. Um, which is defined as the energy and the wavelength of a light ray. So light contains many different colors um, and not all of them have the same effect on our body. Um, the picture um, illustrates the visible light up at the top and you know, goes down to the invisible radiation, which we don't see. But all of the colors that are um, uh, illustrated at the top of the graphic show um, the energy level being low up at the top and very high at the bottom. And blue light specifically has a short wavelength and high energy. So the blue light in the middle there um, is indicated and the, it's actually at the higher level of energy um, for uh, what we consider what, what is visible light. 
Um, so what gives off blue light? Screens, of course, our devices um, and energy efficient lighting does as well. And these things obviously increase our blue light exposure. So again, great during the day, but disruptive at night. So I'm just going to elaborate on what Melanie introduced on the previous slide with blue light. Um, so blue light does have significant um, effects on sleep, especially now due to COVID since everyone or you know more people are working from home and have increased time looking at screens. Um, it is important to note the effect that this, have, this has on our normal sleep cycle. So blue light wavelengths are helpful for work during the day as the, that wavelength of light boosts the tension span, reaction time, and mood, overall making us feel more awake and alert. Um, and part of the way that the body does this, it, or blue light does this, is by suppressing the release of melatonin, the hormone that naturally makes our body sleepy. So when we have less of that, we feel more alert. Um, with more use of screens and blue light at home due to COVID and, you know, just with our increasingly technological society, um, people's natural circadian rhythms are thrown off, which can result in fewer hours of sleep or less restful sleep um, when you are sleeping. There was a Harvard study done that showed that when people's circadian rhythm shifted, their blood sugar levels increased. Um, which further put them at a higher risk for diabetes as well as other cardiovascular problems and depression, as we mentioned. Okay, so getting a good night's rest. These are just some tips and tricks um, to improve your sleep. So to block out any light, which may interrupt that natural sleep cycle that we were talking about, you can use blackout curtains or an eye mask. And some relaxation techniques that Kayla will discuss um, include meditation or aromatherapy. So aromatherapy, um, many of you may know, but if you do not, um, it is using essential oils um, to kind of calm the body and mind. So essential oils are naturally derived compounds that come from different plants. Um, and they've been used in homeopathic medicine for um, you know, for all of history among many different cultures. Um, and they have a multitude of purposes. They're used for cooking, they're used for perfumes, and they've also been increasingly used, especially recently for their healing and calming effects. So when you put essential oils in a diffuser, um, the diffuser helps spread the molecules throughout the air and allows you to breathe them in more easily. When you do inhale them, they enter the body and go up to the brain into the olfactory system, which is the body system that regulates smell. And when the body smells these um, oil molecules from the, from the essential oils, the brain is stimulated to release neurotransmitters called dopamine and serotonin. Dopamine and serotonin both work together to help elevate your mood and induce feelings of calmness and relaxation. Serotonin also stimulates the brain to produce more melatonin which is that sleepy hormone that we spoke about. Um, so in turn, you know, it really does help the body um, produce a calming effect and help us for more restful sleep. Meditation is also a great practice um, to help induce better sleep. And this is an activity that can be done anywhere, anytime. Um, you don't need any equipment besides your body and a quiet space. Um, so what meditation is, it's a mindful practice that helps the person doing it bring awareness to their body and their self um, and to regulate their breathing and in tune by, you know, becoming aware of your body, um, it produces a calming effect within the body. Um, so you're a bit more emotionally calm and stable and therefore better able to sleep. When meditation is done before bedtime, it is shown to help reduce insomnia and sleep troubles, overall resulting in more restful sleep as well. And the way that this happens is, um, like we said, you know, with bringing the attention to the self, the body undergoes physiological changes, um, such as reducing heart rate and blood pressure, which we have mentioned, um, lead to uh, poor sleep. And it also further stimulates the release of serotonin and melatonin, um, those calming and sleepy hormones that we mentioned. Okay, so working from home. So as we know, what would be a presentation on health these days without the mention of 
COVID-19. So COVID-19 obviously has changed a lot for us over the past, I guess, year now. Um, one reality that has become more apparent recently is working from home. So working from home, you know, there's pros and cons. The pros being that it allows for productivity to continue during uncertain times. So, you know, instead of going into the office to do some work, you can do it from, you know, your home. Um, it, but, it, you know, it, as mentioned, it does have detrimental effects like on physical health, you know, your back hurts and mental, mental health alike because it's hard to separate in sometimes, you know, time to work and time to relax. So some things that aid in um, working from home is proper seating and taking breaks throughout the day. They are used to combat the physical and mental stressors that come with working from home. And the CDC has put out helpful tips on working from home to make it a better experience. Oops. To piggyback off of um, what James has been, was reviewing, um, working where you sleep, tip, tips for combining the two. Um, it's definitely difficult and it's something that a lot of us are struggling with at this point. Um, some pointers here. Uh, don't work where you sleep. You really want to keep your sleep sla space as more of a sanctuary for that and um, not so much for working. So if that's possible, then separating the two is really important. Um, keeping your sleep space dark, quiet, cool, and comfortable. Um, doing all of those things to make this space as relaxing as an, and enjoyable as possible so that you have um, an adequate place to rest is extremely important. Transitioning to bedtime um, an hour and a half before is uh, a guideline that um, really helps as well. So that's you know making sure that you're um, turning off the screens, you are um, doing something relaxing, goes into the next point. Use re relaxation techniques or take a warm bath um, during this time to really wind down and make sure that your body, um, you're enabling your body to um, have that restful sleep that's necessary. Um, also really important is watching your intake before bedtime. So making a cutoff for those things that you might enjoy like spicy foods, alcohol, caffeine, chocolate, nicotine, and actually taking special uh, attention to this if you know that you're particularly sensitive to some of this. Um, expose yourself to um, bright lights during the day to strengthen those biological rhythms, that circadian rhythm that I was talking about before. Um, get all your energy out and use, use the, the sunlight to um, really drive that rhythm for your body that is just happening naturally. And get exercise, um, taking a break and taking a simple 10 minute walk, um, get outside to get fresh air. Um, again, if that's possible, that'll help improve the sleep that you do get. Um, and then schedule these tips into your workday. So now that you're working at home, it's important to um, take these tips and put them into your schedule for work as well. So that kind of goes into the next slide, please. How can you schedule this stuff into your work day? So keep a routine, um, doing um, the same things, you know, day in and day, day out at the same time, really get your body into a rhythm. Keep that bedtime and the wake time consistent so that your body can adjust accordingly. Um, schedule exercise into your work day. Um, that's actually something that I feel like when you're working in an office environment or um, a, a di different setting that we may have been used to before, you don't really have the opportunity to go, you know, take it and, you know, run on your treadmill during in the middle of the day or, 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 or what have you. But that's something that you can do now that you're working at home. So scheduling that in is important. Um, plan healthy meals ahead so that you don't have to think about what you're going to eat when you get into the kitchen, um, you know, like meal planning and um, figuring out what you, what you can do on a daily basis to get those, those healthy meals um, involved um, or incorporated into your day. And set boundaries between your personal life and your work life. And that's extremely difficult when you're, you know, you're working where your family or your friends might be, or, you know, you've got distractions that you've never had before, but so setting those boundaries, um, this is my work time, this is my personal life, um, and really sticking to that is important. Um, take frequent breaks. Um, that's, that's to reduce that eye strain we were talking about um, and uh, making sure that you're uh, taking care of yourself in that way. 
um, and connect with others through social distant methods. Um, this is really important, I think, from a, a mental health perspective as well. Make sure that you are, um, you're connecting with people and not just writing emails um, or text messages or, um, you know, do it in a way where you're, you're kind of socially interacting is the best that you can um, at this point. And to that um, point as well, you also kind of want to make sure that you, when you're getting up at the same time every day, try not to sleep in. It's easier to sleep in, but that makes you really sluggish. Um, and get up, get dressed, take a shower and get ready, um, which is something that, you know, you, you, you don't necessarily have to do when you're working from home. And then again, detach from work at the end of the day, create those boundaries and stick to them. Okay, so this kind of goes back to what I was talking about a little bit earlier about the proper seating and um, taking a break while working from home. So it's recommended um, that having an office chair with armrests that you can rest your arms on and a height adequate enough so that your feet are firmly on the ground, it straightens your back and it um, helps reduce like back pain just from sitting all day. Um, avoid working on couches or soft chairs, you know, one from a productivity standpoint I know personally when I'm studying on like my couch or in bed I tend to you know doze off a little bit and lose a little productivity there um if you if that's your only space to work that's work that's okay just make sure you have um pillows to support your back so you're sitting up straight and it's kind of directing your gaze and your attention right to what you're focusing on in front of you also standing up and uh standing up and Taking a break from working throughout the day gives your body a break. You know, it helps blood circulate from, you know, down in your legs to up to the rest of your body, prevents DVTs and all that, all that, that bad stuff that we don't want happening. Also taking a break. So taking a break is very, very important. Um, periodic breaks and changes in posture throughout the day are beneficial. It has shown, research has shown that musculoskeletal discomforts and eye strains are reduced when five minute work breaks are implemented each hour. So just getting up from the computer, Go and, you know, take a little walk around your house or your apartment, looking out the window, just reducing, going back to what Melanie was saying, that that blue light. While it's good during the day, it does cause eye strain and, you know, just having a break from that throughout the day is beneficial. And then throughout the, your work, they have one prolonged break. So lunchtime is a great way, you know, just to take a break, refuel and rest before tackling the rest of your work day. Okay, so combating workplace fatigue. So as we've mentioned, COVID obviously has impacted our workplace and you're no longer necessarily at an office, but you're working from home. So if the previous sleep uh, habits have failed you, here are some tips to combat workplace fatigue. Um, checking in with coworkers to help each other cope is a really good way. Um, a lot of people are in the, um, the same position and being able to um, vent can help you get through the day. Stay hydrated. Um, water can wake you up. You know, we want to decrease that caffeine at the end of the day, but a cup of coffee can't hurt. Um, creating a morning schedule, like Melanie had mentioned, and learning those signs of fatigue. So if you're yawning, if you're finding it difficult to keep your eyes open, if you're having trouble concentrating, these are all signs that you should really um, be looking at those sleep habits that we had mentioned and try to get um, a better sleep uh, a better amount of sleep or better quality sleep at night. Um, and as we mentioned before, take breaks. So if you can leaving home, you know, even going for a drive, if you can go for a walk, if you can fit an exercise in during lunch, those are really great ways to um, come back to the second half of the day a little bit more rejuvenated. Next. Okay, so, um... It's so Nicole again, and now we're gonna just talk about COVID-19 and sleep. Although not everything is known about the coronavirus disease, taking precautions to prevent contracting the illness is vital. The need for sleep to boost your immune system is uh, very necessary. It's one of the best things you could do if you get sick with any virus, especially COVID-19. Your body needs sleep to fight the infection if you're ill and it helps prevent infection if you are not ill. Next slide. Since getting good sleep is so vital to speed up recovery from COVID-19 or any infection, uh, there are some things you can do to promote quality sleep. So consider the following tips 
for sleeping when you're sick. Take a warm bath. A warm bath may ease muscle soreness. It is also a nice way to relax before trying to sleep. Go to sleep a little earlier. Use a humidifier. Place a cool mist humidifier in your room to add moisture to the air. The increased moisture may help decrease congestion and ease coughing. Elevate your head. If you have congestion, placing a few pillows under your head to prop yourself up may decrease stiffness. Create the right environment. The right environment helps promote sleep regardless whether you're sick or not. And relax before going to sleep. With all the current uncertainty in the world, it can be hard to quiet your mind, but taking some time before you sleep um, to relax is very helpful. So everybody should do that. Next slide. So if you are sick or somebody in your house is sick, um, the CDC recommends setting up a sick room to prevent others from the home, in the home from getting sick. So whether it's a bedroom or a guest room, just select an area in your home, preferably near a bathroom, and um, make it a space aside for your sick family member. So uh, these are the things that you should place in their room. A uh, bottle of hand sanitizer, a towel, a glass, some water, tissues, a trash can, and a blanket. Next slide. Okay, so here are some sleep resources we have from the American Sleep Association, a link for how to get better sleep in general, and then calming rituals to help you fall asleep, and then the COVID-19 and sleep. There's just more in-depth information on that on that link. And then the CDC has a couple of resources like sleep education from the American Academy of Sleep Medicine and National Healthy Sleep Awareness Project. And also on that CDC sleep resources page, there's more links. If, if you are interested in those, I would take a look at those. Uh, next slide, please. And if you need additional sleep information, the World Sleep Society has some information and Medline Plus is always a great source for health information. So um, there's the sleep disorders page, but there's general sleep information on there too. So I would take a look at that if you feel so inclined. Okay, so if um, you have any questions, you can ask them now, you can ask them verbally, you can write them into the chat, and we will try and answer them for you as best that we can. So does anybody have any questions? Okay, so if there are no questions, we can just proceed to the next slide. So just a little bit about the uh, Healthy Libraries Program. Stony Brook Medicine's Healthy Libraries Program. Oh wait, actually it looks like we have a question in the chat. So Lori asked suggestions to get back to sleep. Um, does anybody want to answer? We can go back to a slide maybe. We have it there. I have a suggestion. Um, I think that the um, sleep mask and the blackout curtains are a really good way to stay asleep or if you wake up to get back to sleep. Um, I know, you know, the sun, depending on what time of the year it is, the sun might be rising really early or not quite done sleeping and being able to block out that light really helps. Um, and another suggestion, um, if it's, you know, middle of the night, it's still dark out. So that's not your problem. Um, maybe like a noise machine could help. I use one and it's kind of just like a white noise that can really, especially if you didn't have it on before, putting it on in the middle of the night when you wake up can put you back to sleep pretty well. I also know, um, you know, if you do have a problem with waking up in the middle of the night, um, a big thing is not to look at your phone or your iPad um, because again, that has the blue light that tells your brain that it's time to wake up even if it's not. So, um, you know, even if you're restless, try to avoid the phones. Um, 
if you really, really can't sleep, then um, I've heard it suggested to like turn on a dim light and just read a few pages of a book or a magazine um, that can kind of, you know, stimulate your brain to get sleepy again. But you don't want to really look at clocks or, you know, anything that will further stress you out and make you think about not sleeping. Um, and those deep breathing exercises, like you don't even need to get out of bed to do them. You can just lay there, focus on your breathing, and that could possibly help you. I'm also going to drop this uh, link in there in case um, anyone's interested in that. Okay, so I think we can go back to the, um, the other slide that we were on unless anybody else has questions. Okay, so um, just about the program. Stony Brook Medicine's Healthy Libraries program is an interdisciplinary team of public health, nursing, social work, and library science students whose aim is to provide evidence-based health information, screening, and case management to a diverse community of patrons in the public library setting. We refer patrons to promote access to appropriate health and social services programs locally that will address their health and social support needs. And we also offer one-on-one -on -one appointments for free. Uh, next slide. And here is our, um, our links for our YouTube, our Facebook, our website. There's our email in case you have any questions, you can always email us or you could call us if, if you need to or want to, and that's our number. And that's it. So if there are any more questions, you can ask them. And if not, then I hope that this was informative and you enjoyed it.